Poštovani gledatelji, dobrodošli u emisiju Balkan u Evropi. Ja sam Ivana Dragičević. Ja sam Borijan Jovanovski. Evropa je nakon pariških napada čini se na najteži mogući način osjetila kako su u srcu radikalnih i terorističkih pokreta i akcija njezini državljani. Vo top 10 državi izvoznici na takanelčenje te stranski borci vo redovite na islamskata država se najdoa građani od Belgije i Francija, no i Bosna i Hercegovina i Kosovo. Kako je do toga došlo? Tko su evropljani koji odlaze u redove tzv. islamske države i mogu li Evropa i njezin jugoistok, tzv. Zapadni Balkan, zajedno naći rješenje za ovaj čini se gorući problem? Danas u emisiji Balkan u Evropi govore. Naši gosti, gospodin Jozo Radoš, bivši hrvatski ministar obrane, sada zastupnik u Evropskom parlamentu. Dobrodošli. Dobar dan. Andreja Vodanović, predsjednica mladeži Evropske pučke stranke, najbrojnije političke grupacije u Evropskom parlamentu. Dobro nam došli. Glavna tajnica, hvala vam. Glavna tajnica. A so nas je i Fabrice de Herhoff, ekspert od fondacijata Rua Bodoan, a na Skype vrska kje go imamo i Vlado Azinović, profesor i ekspert za prašenja povrzani so terorizmom. Prije nego što počnemo emisiju, pogledat ćemo priču Tine Jelin Dizda, reporterke N1, o prošlotjednom sastanku održanom u Sarajevu između bošnjačkih političkih i društvenih predstavnika s Reisom koji su rekli da nasilje i teror nisu njihov put. Pogledajmo prilog. Predstavnici vjerskog i političkog života, akademske zajednice i civilnog društva stavili su svoj potpis na izjavu koji se osuđuje svaki oblik terorizme i sve terorističke akcije izvedene u Bosni i Hercegovini. U izjavi je izražena odlučnost da se potpisnici institucionalno, intelektualno, moralno i politički suprostave svakom obliku radikalizma. Nasilje i teror nije naš put. Put kojem ide naš narod. Isto tako želimo potvrditi da je Islamska zajednica još 2007. godine donijela svoje deklaracije u kojima je kazala da tumačenje vjere mora biti institucionalno u Bosni i Hercegovini onako kako su naši pređi naučavali. Poslom Hercegovinu nije zaobišlo radikalno tumačenje islama, ali ni teroristički napadi na policajce, povratnike, ambasade i u konačnici pripadnika oružani snaga. Djelovanje koje u suprotnosti sa islamom koji štiti i zgrađuje multijetnički i multikonfesionalni duh Bosne i Hercegovine. Devijantna ideologija tekfira je u uslovima postratnog bosansko-hercegovskog društva našla plodno tlo za prihvatanje i za razvoj. Moram priznati da nismo na vrijeme prepoznali objim opasnosti očirenja ove ideologije. Bezkompromisno djelovanje nadležne institucije ne smije biti atak na one koji vide islam drugačije, ali da na one koji primjenjuju nasilje. Ali taj dio našeg odgovora će biti hiruški precizan i selektivan. Ako ne bude takav, izazvat će novi talas radikalizacije. Osuda je bilo i ranije, no profesor Šačir Filandre dodaje da je ova politička deklaracija čin osvjedočenja odgovornih ljudi da je pojava radikalizacije ozbiljen problem. Ova izjava je hrabra zato što bošnički dužnici preuzimaju odgovornost. Treba biti u naredni pola godine, godinu dana, treba ih pitati šta su konkretno učinili. Ovo ne bi bila jedna zapravo sladunjava izjava za inozemnu javnost. Novinarima danas nije pojašnjeno što zapravo znači hiruški precizno djelovati protiv radikalne ideologije u Bosni i Hercegovini. Niti je zapravo rečeno da li će biti nekih novih koraka nakon ove izjave iz Islamske zajednice Bosne i Hercegovine ili eventualno bošničkih predstavnika vlasti. No ono u čemu se slažu svi jeste da je u protekli 20. godina ovo vjerovatno najodlučnija izjava protiv širenja radikalne ideologije u Bosni i Hercegovini. Tina Jelin Dizdar, N1 Sarajevo. Okay, let's start with Mr. Jozo Radoš, member of the European Parliament, former minister of defense in the Croatian government. Mr. Radoš, uh, radicalization in the Balkans, radicalization in Europe, European Union is facing the serious threat and we saw in the Uh, in Paris, we saw what's happening happened in Brussels. So, uh, what, how how you define the problem of the ra radicalization? Who who are the people who are threatening Europe and the stability of Europe, or who are being radicalized? It is clear that uh, these are young people, mostly young people, and of course there are different soci sociological reasons for for their radicalization. 
why it is happened now, not before. Uh, there are different answers on that question. But it is mostly young people, people who are not integrated, uh, people who are not, uh, uh, who are, don't have the, the, their place in society, who are mar marginalized, uh, who are uh, living in property, in, in, in poverty. All these reasons are present in all this country, in Belgium and in Kosovo and Bosnia and Herzegovina. Mr. Uh, uh, Kerkhoff, uh, we saw Brussels and Molenbeek as uh, it, it was perceived as a kind of headquarters of the of the Jihadi radical movement, jihadi yeah. movement. So, what are the profile of the the people that were engaged in this uh, in this radicalization and in this all this action? in Paris and even the treaty of, for the Brussels. Mm -hmm. Well, these are mostly young people, as I've mentioned, uh, Minister. Um, young people, but uh, I think there are differences to believer, be made. Believer, not believer, who they are? Uh, mostly they are coming from the Muslim communities mm -hmm. and mostly from the Moroccan uh, community. They have a Moroccan background, migration background, uh, most, in most of the cases. But what we see is that in most of the cases these are uh, some sort of newborn Muslims because most of them are quite ignorant with regard to religion and that's probably one of the reasons why they're so open to radical ideas is that these are people who uh, uh, whose value the, the Islam Islamic values were not transmitted to them uh, from their uh, parents and I think there is one uh, important uh, difference to be made between radicalization in, in Belgium and France and radicalization in the Balkans is the fact that uh, it affects mostly uh, people who are uh, at the same time religiously ignorant but more educated than the average uh, people uh, with the migrant backgrounds. So these are not really the poorest people, you know, small thieves or um, coming from, you know, poor families and uh, ghettoized uh, environment. These are people in, and we see that more and more coming from the middle class. And there is also a rising number of uh, converted people converted young radical, uh, radicalized people. Whereas in the Balkans, of course, uh, I think there is a combination of political instability, uh, poor economic situation, uh, and the fact that the young radicalized people are belonging to the dominant faith, which is not the case in Belgium, whereas they belong to a minority somehow. Uh, I wanted to ask you all, uh, we all know that in Europe, basically, we had this integration problem for years. We have riots in France in 2005. Uh, we had riots in, in London a couple of years after that. But this is the first time after the, how to say, uh, uh, ISIS showed up in the world map that we have this kind of terror attacks. Uh, on our soil. I want to ask Andrea, you worked as a huge political network throughout Europe. You also uh, had your own analysis uh, about uh, things going on. So how can uh, this issue be solved in Europe of today where we do see large social and economic discrepancies inside of these societies and especially young people? Yeah, I think so that the reason why so many young people joined and uh, joined forces, actually the, the Belgium is number one, if I'm not wrong, state that with foreign per capita, fighters, yes. yeah, per capita, um, that uh, it's uh, the fact that we are facing now huge uh, unemployment rate in Europe. And uh, so people, young people are very desperate. So uh, on the other side, I think that they're also uh, searching for their own identities, new in that identities that are going to be built. Uh, when it comes to us as a youth of the European People's Party uh, as the largest political youth organization in Europe. We believe that uh, the number one issue on the agenda now in Europe should be a fight against terrorism. Mm -hmm. In this case it is uh, ISIS, but uh, as we heard, we had a terrorism on the European soil also before. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, radicalization of the youth uh, should be tackled from different perspectives. First of all, from education, that should be a number one, but then also to build in the common understanding because we truly believe that European project is the best peace project and that we have to be united in diversity. Uh, therefore, there is a long way uh, to, to fulfill that uh, goal. 
Mr. Razinovic, uh, if we can uh, join in our guests via Skype from, from Sarajevo. Professor Razinovic, you did a lot of research in the Balkans, especially and in Bosnia and Herzegov Herzegovina. How did this, uh, how to say, shift happen? Because we saw a lot of uh, incidents that happened, including young people on the territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which, was, uh, which were emphasized as uh, terrorism there. So uh, what happened basically with youth in a country where uh, Islam was always uh, as everywhere basically should, should be the religion of peace, where the communities were living together, where there was basically, in this sense, no problem with that. So how this this switch happened? Well, this uh, radical and militant ideology was introduced to Bosnia during the Bosnian War, almost quarter of a century ago. So uh, 25 years later, it's not imported, it's indigenous ideology. So there's a whole generation of young people that's been born uh, and associated with, with this uh, sort of uh, ideological view or the, or the, the world view. Uh, what has changed now is that uh, perception of ISIL is that ISIL is some sort uh, of a Robin Hood organization uh, that is revenging all the wrongs that have been committed to this identity group. And many young people see ISIL as a force that empowers them and they would like to join in. But on the other hand, uh, the messages that ISIL has been sending out has gradually been changed. Uh, initially, in 2013, ISIL was calling people to join jihad. Now, they are calling people uh, to perform hijra, which means to uh, mimic uh, what Prophet Muhammad did in, 60, in 622 when he moved from Mecca to Medina. So we have whole families moving uh, from Bosnia and from other parts of, of the Balkans uh, to follow this call, and they're moving to, to the state they are now having in Syria and Iraq. And it's a new phenomenon, it's a new challenge, and uh, it's also very attractive for a lot of young individuals who are vulnerable, and many of them have a history of drug addiction, uh, and they probably just rubbed shoulders with real radicals but felt tempted to carry out terrorist attacks. And that's what we've been witnessing over the last couple of years. In order to define uh, who are the people who join ISIS, uh, would, I would like to, to, to ask you, all of you, uh, we found the case of the Mas uh, Macedonian girl with the, uh, with the Bel Belgium citizen, with Macedonian uh, origin, uh, origin yeah. with uh, a Christian background. Uh, he, uh, he, uh, she came in, in Belgium eight years ago. She's 16 years old, and she decided to join ISIS. It's a kind of phenomena which couldn't be identified with the fact that some part of the population is belonging to the Muslim country or whatsoever. I'm asking this question uh, because you, you, you said that the, the priority for the European Union should be the, be the fight against the terrorism. But in order to fight efficiently terrorism, we have to find the definition and the to, to, to find the uh, diagnostic why we have the people in Europe ready to join mm -hmm. this kind of forces. So okay. shall we start with Mr. Azinovic maybe because you are very much involved in the analysis of these issues? Yes, uh, I think there are lots of cases of conversion from uh, either secularism or atheism or Christianity uh, to what we now call radical Islam. But there's also a lot of conversion from uh, traditional Muslim families in, into uh, this particular brand. Uh, but there's a number of motives, and there's no one unique set of motives that motivates every single individual. So we have a mixture. For 19 or 18-year boys, it's adrenaline-driven adventure. Uh, they, of course, mix it with, with religion, but they uh, feel a sense of belonging. They feel a sense of purpose in life. There's a group dynamic involved. They are empowered. They are self-validated when they join what they see as a revolutionary force. Uh, there's a lot of sexual drives in this because there are, these are teenage boys and girls, very often who came from uh, families where any kind of sexualism suppressed. So there is some kind of sexual liberation in many of, of their uh, decision making. So there is a variety of, of, of motives that leads people uh, into embracing these sorts of ideology and, and joining eventually ISIL. Uh, 
lot of European strategies said, okay, we are going to use military force. We now saw a series of European countries going militarily fighting against ISIS in Syria. But on the other hand, back home, we have to do our homework and work with these issues, what Ms. Vodanovic mentioned, education and other stuff. So from your perspective as a former minister uh, of defense, how can these two be put together in these circumstances? I don't see these uh, two approaches mm -hmm. uh, uh, similar because uh, military uh, answer is a military answer. And uh, we, we think about, uh, about uh, prevention. It, 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 it is a fully different activity. Of course, uh, military action uh, should be uh, common and it is a different problem, different approach. Uh, ten, ten, ten countries uh, now, now present on the theater on the, on the, about uh, around Syria uh, have different interests. That is problem, that is European problem too. But we are talking about prevention of the radicalization and uh, we are talking about uh, Muslim uh, radicalization. But it is not only Muslim radicalization. It is a general problem of, of uh, the modern society that people who are not Muslims and they don't have any connection with, with Muslim religion uh, made uh, terrible uh, uh, crimes uh, last, last year. What, not, not so, so what, what should be the... Uh, yes, please. Well, what I see now, because of the recent events and attacks in Paris, we tend to address this issue with the counter-terrorism frame only. So, of course, it's important to secure, to uh, ensure the security of the population by preventing further, uh, any further terrorist attacks. But I think Although, these are... sorry to interrupt you, but we see engagement of the enormous quantity of the military and police forces in, in Absolutely. Brussels. Absolutely. Nothing happened out of it. No, but uh, that's, that's, that's a sign, a signal to the yeah. population to say, well, you shouldn't be afraid, we're protecting you. But these are short-term measures. And I think there are, we have to deal, we have to implement some long-term processes that will address all the factors that feed the radicalization process. And this is really long-term. So I think we need to balance all the uh, uh, short-term security measures with long-term prevention measures. That, and, and through these prevention measures also, uh, for instance, uh, there is a, a project uh, uh, of a decision by the Belgian government to uh, put in jail every returnee from Syria or Iraq. So that will be a systematic uh, uh, approach to, uh, to the return of jihadis. Um, okay, well, is it a good idea? I don't want to judge, but the fact is uh, prisons are the best incubators of radicalization. And what will happen when they go out of prison? So, and uh, do you find among the returnees some, uh, of course, uh, uh, people who are who could become a threat to the security but you have a lot of uh, young people who were disappointed or disillusioned or traumatized by their experience in Iraq or Syria so which means that we need to have these security measures that are always balanced or complemented by a prevention or social measures that aim to the reintegration of these people in, in the society to put them back on track because otherwise you know all those people are um, in, in, a, in a kind of a fight against the society as a whole. So, and if you put them back in prison, their, their anger will, will increase instead of, uh, of, um, of anything else. Mr. Razinovich, how can we interpret this uh, statement we heard at the beginning of our program that came from Bosniak leaders from Sarajevo? I think this statement articulates a, a feeling among many uh, Bosnian Muslims for almost uh, 10 or 15 years. And that is that whenever a terrorist attack uh, happens, and it's usually committed by someone who claims that has carried out the attack in the name of Islam, uh, people who are Muslim and who have nothing to do with it, they don't subscribe to it, they don't support it, they are not associated with it, they somehow feel this sense of guilt, which is by automaticity assigned to these groups. And I think uh, this statement is also a sign of frustration. Uh, accumulated frustration uh, by the Bosnian leadership and Bosniaks in general, uh, who feel like they, they've been blamed for something they, they are not associated with in, in any particular way. And also, I have to say that um, our Islamic community should be complimented and should be applauded 
uh, for the attitude that it's taken against uh, departures to Syria and Iraq from the outset. Uh, and Grand Mufti is saying very loudly and clearly from the outset that this is uh, not the way we should go, <clears throat> that this is not our war, that our people should not go there. Unfortunately, I believe that uh, a huge chunk of, of Bosnian political elite hid actually behind uh, the Grand Mufti because they were not so vocal in expressing their nation uh, of this practice before. Mr. Azinovic, uh, Mr. De Kerkhoff mentioned the problem of Belgium, what to do with the people who are coming back from, from, from Syria. Uh, what, what do you think, how the Balkan states, having in mind that, that many of them are still very weak, how, 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 what do you think, how, how they have to answer, how did, uh, what, what should be the strategy in order to receive back those people who want to come back, who want to come back from Syria? I think it has to be a multifaceted approach. A uh, state uh, must have instruments and tools uh, police and judiciary to defend itself. But I think that we all as societies have to assume a more proactive role. Our research has shown that basically everything, almost everything starts within the family. We have cases of people who are not radicalized, who are not radical, who are not aggressive, who ended up uh, in Syria, in Iraq, simply because something in the family went wrong and there was nobody else to talk to them. Uh, except those radical Salafists who are always on hand uh, to provide support, care, attention, money when needed. And basically, people who would never be associated with, with, with radical ideology ended up fighting other people's war. So I believe that we have to empower our societies and the remaining correctives from the family, social services, academic community, NGOs, in order to combat this, this phenomenon. And also beside this that uh, Mr. Razinović was talking about, uh, 25.11. u Zagrebu je održan summit uh, Brdo Brijuni, pitanje radikalizacije, pitanje u stvari perspektive mladih na Zapadnom Balkanu bila jedna od ključnih tema i zaključaka. Poslušajmo uh, kratko izjave hrvatske predsjednice Kolinde Grabar-Kitarović i predsjednika Europskog vijeća Donalda Tuska. Jedan sveopuhvatan pristup terorizmu mora uključivati borbe protiv ekstremizma, sprečavanja radikalizacije i poticanja terorističkih dijela, ali isto tako bavljenti se pitanjem stranih ratnika te stvari mogu riješiti samo zajedničkim naporima, tako da će Europska unija nastaviti raditi zajedno sa jugoistočnom Europom i SED-o o tome. To je naša zajednička odgovornost i vjerujemo da u teškim vremenima u svijetu koji je među povezan kao nikad prije suradnja između nas je ključna i te sve seljem očekujem danje jačanje naše suradnje suočeni sa zajedničkim izazovima. Pozvali smo na učinkovita i djelotvorna globalna rješenja usmjerena na rješavanje uzroka radikalizma, nasilnog ekstremizma i terorizma koji utječu na sve nas. Ključna je šira međunarodna suradnja kao i bolja koordinacija i razmjena informacija među policijskim agencijama. Talking about coordination, we have next week European summit. One of the main subjects, as Mr. Tusk was saying, will be the question of radicalization in Europe. Plus, you are uh, MP in the European Parliament. We had a report of Ms. Rashida Dati about uh, the radicalization. So basically, what can European institutions do at uh, these circumstances? Mr. Radosh, and then to Ms. Vodanovic. It is not new, no new item. Uh, European Union adopted counter-terrorism strategy in 2005 and in 2014 revised the uh, strategy for combating radicalization and recruitment to terrorism. It is a uh, famous, uh, well-known doc documents. Now, of course, things are uh, radicalized and more intensified. What, what to do? Just to implement everything what is, what is uh, put in, in these strategies. That means uh, to, 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 uh, to, to work on prevention, but it is a question how long, to, how f far to go. In this case, when, when uh, in Belgium there's the idea to, to put in jail people who come from the from, from, uh, Middle East, uh, there, there are ideas uh, to, to arrest people who pro 
make propaganda on, on terrorist attack, mm -hmm. to, to, to punish uh, intention to, 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 to become the, 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 the foreign fighters, but to ban the, the, the free of speech in mosques. But it is, of course, it is uh, in conflict with, with the basic value of European societies. It is freedom of speech. So how to long go and, and how to deal with it, it is a big question. It is not e e easy to answer on, on your question. How to prevent the, the recruitment of the young people? Yeah, I think that uh, cooperation among the member states and also institutions themselves here is crucial. Uh, till the end of the year, it's uh, quite obvious that uh, we will have to uh, think again about the PNR system mm -hmm. and the exchange of the information among the intelligence services uh, within the member states, but also within the uh, neighborhood is crucial, I think. When it comes to how to prevent uh, young people to joining ISIS, uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, we should invest more in education and common understanding. and. Uh, I think that we should also face the fact that terrorists are terrorists anywhere. You know, it doesn't matter uh, their uh, religious background, their uh, uh, nationality or sex. As we said, 16 years old girl who joined ISIS is a terrorist, same as uh, 50 years old uh, man. So, uh, but I think that the uh, first step when it comes to uh, current situation in Europe should be that we face that uh, our freedom is under attack. So we should defend our freedom and freedom of uh, our citizens. So uh, I believe that uh, the further steps uh, are going to be done by the European Parliament and other European institutions, same as the member states. Mm -hmm. Mr. De Kerkhoff, uh, you were witness of, uh, of what happened in Brussels re recently. Uh, we see the intentions of the Belgium government, of the European Union as a, as, a, as a whole, and the old European government. Now the uh, imperative is the priority of fighting the terrorism. But do you think that we are in a very sensitive period and in, in danger, let's say, to 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 um, crush our own crush European our, values. Our, our, <laughs> of course, and the uh, human basic human rights, having in mind this, you know, uh, events, yeah, action against terrorism. Well, that's the, the, that's the risk. I think we need to have safeguards in order to prevent uh, any uh, security measures that are dictated by the uh, the, 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 the events and the. the the urgent need for security not to breach uh, the basic human rights, so, uh, of course, because uh, that that's will be an issue when uh, the, the whole idea is to isolate, for instance, um, young uh, radicalized people who are in jail to put them in a separate section. How do you consider that they are radicalized or not? Because they have a long beard or because they, uh, you know, uh, they, they, they tend to speak, uh, to talk about radical, uh, radical ideas. It's not so obvious, it's not clear cut. So I think it will be, uh, for this reason, it will be extremely important to further investigate about this phenomenon because which is, uh, it's not new as such. Radicalization is not new. As we heard, it started in um, uh, in in, uh, in, the, uh, in in the Balkans uh, uh, during the the, the war uh, in ex uh, former Yugoslavia. So, but the fact that young people, the flow of young people leaving Western European countries going to Syria and Iraq, that's a fairly new phenomenon, and we see that uh, the level of expertise to address that issue. Uh, in the various member states is still very low. So I think there is a need to, to further study the phenomenon and to try to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to, try to, to exchange good practices that are implemented at the, low, uh, at the, the local level in order to, um, to address this issue. And I would like to come back to, if I, uh, I may, to a point that was made by Mr. Azinovich about the need to work with families. Because this is uh, the entry point uh, of uh, the King Baudouin Foundation's activities with regard to radical radicalization. Uh, because there are very few foundations that were ready to start working on this issue. And we decided to do so by focusing on the support to families, because they are at the core of the issue. You know, families are victims of the radicalization process because of their, their, their children go, are, are being... Uh, uh, recruited by ISIS without being aware of that the time that they realized the, the, the children are gone. But uh, this is the, in the family circle and uh, in the broad sense of the term, this is where the recruitment takes place. You know, there is a kind of uh, uh, horizontal recruitment uh, system where one brother is going to recruit his other brother, cousins, neighbors, friends and so on. 
but families are also uh, the sources of the solution as well. So that's why it's very important to invest them. And that's uh, where, uh, again, there is very little expertise available. Very, very few programs are still are available. Now. Mr. Az Azinovic, uh, to finish the, this debate, how to, how to fight the terrorism at, but to prevent the respect of human rights? I think this is a, a completely new set of security challenges that we haven't faced to, the, to, that, to, to that extent in the past. And we actually are adopting uh, in the process. And I think we need a lot of research uh, and we should not rush into radical measures uh, motivated by our mere fear. Uh, so we should tread very carefully and think very carefully about every move that we make. And I think uh, in order to achieve that, we need more research on this phenomenon because it's completely new and we simply don't have the right answers to so many questions. Thank you very much. Well, new time, new challenges. Thank you to all of our guests for being with us tonight. Poštovani gledatelji, hvala i vama što ste bili uz još jedan Balkan u Evropi. Srdečan pozdrav.